may have heard of me. I'm married to Elizabeth Roy, and everybody knows her, so <laughs> that's my introduction. Uh, a special warm welcome to you as you come here today, and I just hope that out of the uh, and trust that out of the busyness of the week and all of the other activities that we're involved in, that we can just dedicate this hour that we're spending here today, that it may be a special time. I've had a pretty interesting and busy week. On, um, on Monday I was uh, chairing a conference in Christchurch and we had two of the best motivational speakers that I've had in a long time. One of them you will have heard of. His title was Building a Winning Culture, and his name was Scott Robertson, Crusaders coach. An hour of him, and I was looking for my rugby boots. <laughs> but I got to reflect a wee bit on it. Do you know what? We're all part of a winning culture, aren't we? As followers of Jesus, we're in a winning culture, and I was just reflecting on that a little bit. And last week, we do as a devotion this word for the day. And for three days of last week, the title of the devotion for each day was Science Acknowledges Prayer. And there's 14 different longitudinal studies mentioned through various um, universities and uh, places in America and, and I'll just read the first, I'm not going to go through the whole 14, but um, science acknowledges prayer. God's word clearly tells us to pray about everything. That's in Philippians 4. Today, science is beginning to recognise the value and power of prayer. Researchers investigating the role of faith and health are discovering evidence that's hard to refute. For example, a 2014 study conducted by the Mind Health report confirmed that people who engage in private prayer and intercessory prayer and church activities are healthier and live longer. And there's 14 illustrations of longitudinal studies of people who are involved in the Christian faith and advantages across health and a whole range of things. And I thought, well, we are part of the winning culture, aren't we? Amen. And that's, yeah, well, amen, absolutely. <laughs> So just as a call to worship this morning and reflecting on just the winning team that we're in, here's, I'll just take some verses out of chapter 4 of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. So we come this morning to open ourselves up to what God might be saying to us and what we might have to say to people around us. So welcome to the service this morning and let's begin by singing um, the first song which is My Heart is Filled.
Let's just uh, dedicate some time to God in prayer and, and have, give some thanks as well. So just let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning to worship in your name. And we thank you for the freedoms that we have around being able to express our Christian faith where in many places around the world it is not so easy. And we just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for those people who um, preach your word <clears throat> and witness. And Lord, we just give you thanks for your Bible. We give you thanks for Jesus who died on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that in every way you are intensely interested in us. And while you sit over a universe that's so large that we can't even comprehend it, you love us as individuals and you want to be part of our lives. And Lord, we thank you for that. We just pray you would open our hearts this morning to hear what you have to say to us. And as we come and we reflect this morning, Lord, we would just say the prayer that you taught us to say. So we just say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, you can come, your Lord, you can on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now we have the celebration time and we've got the lollies. So we're going to do birthdays first. So now we don't want you to be squeamish about owning up to a birthday. You need to celebrate birthdays. Not having birthdays is a very bad place to be. Right? So, so what have we got in the birthday line? Now, Rachel Robinson would like to see this. How about that? We've got any of them? Any other significant things? notices, I've got one, which is men and mates are having their two-weekly Bible study. It's tomorrow night at Craig Donaldson's place in Roslyn Road. So that's an important time for that little group to get together. Who need any other notices? Cool. Thank you. Just come up and share the news. Two today. I think I had three last week. Uh, the SIM Mission Group will meet at 9.45am this coming Wednesday morning in the church lounge. And if you're interested in learning about our missionaries and praying for them, please come along. Everyone is welcome. They think they start with the morning tea first, so that will be nice. Now also, word for today, Richmond Grove haven't received as yet, but Windsor have got a uh, big box of them out there, so if you're wanting a word for today, the they're out there in the foyer and we'll have ours next week. It doesn't matter, Richmond Grove, people can take one from, from Windsor, and they've got their wee pottle for their donation to go in. Thank you. Beautiful. Any others? Yep, right. Chop, chop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that um, Windsor Youth Group starts back tonight um, at four, so just if there are any young people, kind of 12 and up, who would like to join us. So we're going to meet here tonight at four, and then I think once Lynn and I kind of talk about it, we've got a very fun activity planned for tonight. And also if any of you have grandkids in that same age range that, you know, you'd want to kind of send my way, <laughs> um, you know, it'd be, yeah. 
just, just repeat again where and what time. So we're meeting here at um, Richmond Grove in the same hall where Children's Church is, and we're meeting here at four. So we are going to be heading out today. So if you are either wanting to come or send your grandkids, um, just let them know to try to be here at four so that we can leave pretty promptly. Cool. Yeah, hopefully the weather improves a little bit. Um, we shouldn't be spending too much time outside, but um, we've got a kind of scavenger hunt planned so the kids can kind of determine how much time they'll be outside because we'll probably be in the car most of it. But um, it'll be good fun regardless. So, yeah, but do if um, let them know to just bring a jacket just in case. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's beauty. Right, any other messages or notices? Right, that's great. Now, uh, the free will offering will be gathered, and we just, while that's happening, we're going to have some music, a thousand hallelujahs. So we'll do that now. Thank you. We are all faithful stewards, stewards of our time, our talents and our money so that our treasure is in heaven and our giving pleases God. Reading from Acts 20 verse 35, we remember the words our Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray. God of generous love, you have reached out to us and blessed us in so many ways, especially through the most precious gift of all, Jesus Christ. This morning we ask a blessing on each one of us as we place in your hand all that we're able to bring to you. We thank you for the privilege of sharing these resources with others. And this morning we pray, Lord, for your constant presence with us all. We honour you and praise your wonderful, blessed name through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right, it's time for kids to go out to Kids Church. So I've actually got a wee talk I was going to do, but I don't see many kids, but let's have you down here anyway. Let's see who turns up, and we, we're going to do this, I think. So I've got some interesting stuff in my little bag here. Yeah, oh, well, I won't. Thank you. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, good man. Who else have we got? I might have to. I'm going to do this. I really want to do this. This is important. <laughs> so I might have to get some mums and dads to, because I need a few people to do props. All right? So I've got some stuff here in my bag. Right. I think you can hear me. What's this? It's a helmet. Yeah, would you like to wear it? Oh, come on. We're going to have more than one person. Lynn? Shoot. Right, here we go, thank you. What's this one? Here we go. Great, Will. Not going to muck around. What about this one? Oh, yeah. What? Yeah, I'll take the sponsors from the back. Yeah, that's right. I used to wear these once. When I was about your age. But now I wear it quite a lot because when I work with deer, um, it, it sort of kind of looks after you get a deer that gets to an inch. Do I put that on? Come on, let's draw it. There we go. You look magnificent. <laughs> this one here. Anybody a hoodlum? Come on. Do you want to put that one on? Yeah. Right, are you going to do that? Right, over, we're just about there. Right, so that's this one. You know, what do these do? They protect you. Okay. Doesn't anyway, you know, it says in the Bible to put on the helmet of salvation. That's what God says to us to do. And if we believe in God and we improve God in what we do, He provides a bit of. Um, protection and looking after us in a way. And that's why when I opened the service, I said there was some interesting stuff now coming out of sight. And in Romans it says, nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love. That doesn't mean that you won't at times have disappointment or things go wrong or get sick, but you're constantly under God's care and protection when you put on the helmet of salvation, which is in Ephesians. Isn't that cool? I'll right, we'll get the helmets back. And now I'm going to pray for you. Right. Here we go. Cool. Thank you very much. And let's just have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these young people. We thank you, Lord, that you provide protection and care. And Lord, we know by reading your word, that children were important to you and you said suffer the little children to come unto me and we just pray Lord for these young people that they can put on the helmet of salvation and be part of your team and grow into mighty people who represent you in the best possible way just bless them we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. Cool, where you go <laughs> Yep, right out Gee they were reluctant weren't they am I that scary? <laughs> Thank you, Craig and others who <laughs> built in. Right, so we've got a couple of songs now. Cynthia, do you want to talk to us about the songs you've chosen? I do. Thank you. And I'm going to stay seated because that's easier than playing with the microphone too much. Um, it's an inside job. I was really pleased to hear you, um, Eric, talking about the word for today because those of you who read the word for today will know that there have been three or four. Um, readings about it's an inside job and it really relates to what I'm talking about this morning or what we're going to sing about this morning. So I just really want to share two thoughts with you. Um, and children's talk again comes perfectly in with what I want to say because we all have ups and downs. We have days that are really good, we have times that are really good, we have times that are not so good. And Lauren Daigle, who wrote the song You Say, was very aware of that. She's written a chorus that really sustains me and I hope it will sustain you when you've heard it as well. It says, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I am falling short and when I don't belong. Oh, you say I am yours and I believe. That is such, those are such powerful words, especially in those days that aren't going very well. And in the goodness of God, Again, it's, it's an opportunity for us to think about what God has done for us this week. Focus on that thought and turn ourselves to Jesus as we sing these songs and let him speak to you as we sing.
Let's just join in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is quite troubled. And daily in the news, on TV, in the papers, on the radio, wherever we hear again and again of things that are not happening as you would want them to happen. Some of this stuff, Lord, is really seriously disastrous. The war in Ukraine, animosity, bombings, rockets, aggression, all sorts of things. And, and whilst we might look overseas and say, Lord, this is terrible what is happening, and it is, and we pray, Lord, for your intervention and common sense and Christian values to prevail and, and consideration of neighbours and all those things, Lord, we will want to happen. We also see it in our own community and it's almost a daily event, event where we see shootings and police interventions and, and a lot of things happening in our own society which is very distressing. And Lord, we know that it's because we have stepped away from your values, the way in which you would want us to conduct ourselves, the message that is in your scripture. Lord, the world has stepped away from that. And in many ways, Lord, We've been um, lacking in our ability to be the perfect witness we should be. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen us as individuals, whether we're um, operating in our family, in our community, in our work, or, or in a wider realm. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen us, you would give us wisdom, Lord, you would give us courage. And so we would not do things by either forgetting or omitting to do them or doing them intentionally, but, Lord, that we would be in tune with how you would want us to conduct our lives. So, Lord, we just pray for ourselves. We pray for our community of Invercargill. As we come up to local body elections, we just pray for, Lord, you to anoint the leadership that you would want in this city. And we just pray for those people who are standing for various positions of election, that, Lord, your hand would be on where we go and, and what we should do as a, as a city. And we just pray, Lord, again, that you would be in our lives as well as we talk to our neighbours, as we talk to our families, as for just in every single aspect that we do, we open ourselves up to you. And, Lord, now as we just want to learn from you, we just pray a blessing on Craig as he brings your word to us. We pray that you would make our hearts and our minds receptive. Lord, if there are clear messages that you want to get into our being, we just pray today that this would be an opportunity where we can make ourselves attuned with what you are saying to us, that, Lord, we can be better Christians, that we can be better witnesses, that we can be the sons and daughters of God that you wish us to be. And we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Great. Morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, look at a, a passage in Acts 16. Hopefully, it's on the screen behind me. It is. So, we're reading Acts 16 from verses 16 to 36. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day, until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, 
and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all those who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptised. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his house, entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave, go in peace. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could be here this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to hear your word. We pray, Lord, that we would set aside everything else that's going on busy in our minds and we would concentrate on what you have to say to us this morning, that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and what he might teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, imagine you're in a courtroom and uh, there's a judge up the front and he asked the woman in the dock, what has she stolen? She replied, I stole a can of peaches. The judge says, well, how many peaches are there in a can? Six, replied the woman. After, the, after due consideration, the judge decided to sen sentence her for one night in prison for every peach that she stole. Six nights in total. At this moment, the woman was helpless and started to bawl her eyes out in the dock. And before the judge was about to slam the mallet down to make it final, her husband yelled from the back, Your Honour, wait, he said. The judge froze and listened to what the husband had to say. She also st stole a can of peas. <laughs> now today we're going to look at um, prison, a prison in a place called Philippi. But uh, Paul and Silas weren't there for stealing peaches or peas. And I'll just... There's three key themes I want to just to look at. Uh, there's a lot in this passage, but there's three things that I want to just to focus on. And the first one is just about our relationship with money uh, and staying free from the dangers that it can uh, have. The second one is family and how important a family is in the kingdom of God. And the last one is how do we stay spiritually sensitive. Well, let's just go back to the story and this is Paul and Silas and a whole other group going through uh, the middle, well, Asia Minor as it's called and he, Paul's taken to the mission field and in verses 6 to 18 of the previous, uh, in the previous ver uh, readings or verses the Spirit forbids Paul to go to Ephesus we don't know how but it, it, we're just told that it forbid him to go. And Paul was acutely aware of that. He then sought to go to a place called Bithynia, and then again he was prevented by the Holy Spirit of heading to Bithynia. I think there's a toy there. There it is, Bithynia. We've got a new toy. <laughs> again, we don't know how the Spirit stopped him going there. And then he had this vision of a Macedonian man wanting help. And so he was called over to this area where Philippi is in Macedonia. And here he met a lady called Lydia, if you've heard of her, who dealt in purple cloth. And the Lord opened her heart and her and her whole household were baptised. And that's where we pick up this, this reading. And Paul starts to get stalked by this slave girl. And she was making money for her owners with divination to be able to tell the future because she was possessed by an evil spirit. And for many days, it says, many days, she followed Paul and Silas in their group, 
And she kept declaring that they were servants of God, telling people how to be saved. And it said that she annoyed Paul so much. And the, the Greek word they use has the same sort of meaning as exhausted, piercing fatigue, or worn out. I wonder if the modern word might be nag. But she just went on and on about Paul and Silas, how these were servants of the high God. To the point where Paul was angry enough to set her free. And this, of course, set the owners into a rage of anger because all their profits that were making out of this girl were gone. And they seemed to pick up on Paul and Silas because they were Jews and they arrested them and then they said they bit them severely in prison. And we sort of think of sentences here and think it's more like a slap with a wet bus ticket. But this was a severe flogging. And here Paul and Silas ended up in prison and what's their response? They were singing hymns and prayers at midnight. I don't know if, know if I could last a midnight sometimes, but they, here they were, praising God in a jail after they'd just been beaten up. The jailer was about to kill himself when this earthquake happened because he thought all the prisoners were going to escape, and that would have been his lot. He would have been killed because he was in charge. But instead, Paul and Silas stayed and because they stayed, they witnessed to him, and his whole household was saved. It's a pretty amazing passage, and I would encourage you to read the whole chapter uh, at your leisure this week, because it's a lot in it. So just the first thing I wanted to look at was the dangers of money, because this slave girl had been making money for her owners by predicting the future. And she was demon-possessed, but as soon as she was delivered, the money went and the owners knew that. And that's when they took, took to Paul and Silas. And there was a further example in Acts 19 of a silversmith who also was making money out of the, um, making idols. And when Paul challenged him, the money dried up. The feelings started to come out. Ironic that the slave girl should be freed, yet the owners were the slaves. They were slaves to money. How does losing money affect us? How does it affect our thoughts and our behaviours? Does a drop in the house market worry you? Does a drop in the share market worry you when you get those funny little dashes in front of your returns that indicate it's make, making less money and a loss? What about a drop in the dairy payout? Does it affect your feelings? Does it make you anxious? Does it make you uncomfortable or twitchy? What about inheritances or farm succession? Does greed and or grief overwhelm us with our views of money to the point where it damages relationships? Does the influence thought of losing that sometimes affect our relationship with God as well? We need to look at ourselves and examine these things. Sometimes it's hard to work it out. Sometimes we can't see our own behaviour and our own response. They often say that grief, grief can come with death. And that an outlet for this sometimes re rears its ugly head when dealing with a will and suddenly everyone's at loggerheads. As they say, where there's a will, there's a way, or where there's a will, there's a relative. So suddenly we're all after money and suddenly we're at, at our own families. And unfortunately we've seen too many examples of that in our own lives. Usually this bad behaviour is a result of insecurity. When do we feel safe or secure with how much money we've ever got? When do we have that perfect contentment? Sometimes enough is never enough. And somehow we're replacing security in the Lord with security in our bank account or our equity. So how should Christians approach money? How do we stay free from its enslavement? How do we avoid, avoid these traps and tricks that go with obsession of money? Because the love of money is unfortunately the root of all evil a barrier to our personal uh, peace, and it gives us anxiety and grief. Paul talks about godly contentment in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That might be too small to read. Also in Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13, I'm not saying it because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. 
and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And where do we put our strength? We'll find our strength not in our money, in our God. It's a great promise. Do we have that peace? And remember this passage that uh, we're talking about is written in Philippi, where he wrote Philippians 4. Are we thankful for the resources we have, or are we anxious about everyone else's, how much they have? Why does it bother us when Bill Gates buys a brand new car, yet when we see our, our neighbour with a new one, we get a bit twitchy? Contentment, what a wonderful concept. Also, as Christians, are we miserly and bitter and enslaved by holding on to our money, or are we known as generous? Is that the first thing that strikes you when you think of a Christian as generosity? Because it should be. Psalm 112, verse 5. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their fears with justice. And Matthew 10, verse 8. Freely we have received, freely give. Are we known as generous, thankful people? Are we known as people who put our trust in God rather than money that we may or may not have? This is a fresh reminder to look at the way we act or our attitudes to our funds and bring glory to God, not grief to ourselves. The next bit I wanted to look at is just the importance of family, particularly in the kingdom of God. And in this passage, and, and also the passage before, we talk about two households that became Christians, the whole household. The whole household was baptised, the household of Lydia and the household of the jailer. And as I look at our Western culture and at the present time, it's, a, it's becoming evident that we've become more individualistic, that individualism rather than family is our predominant thought. We're conditioned by advertising and marketing to look after number one. Look at the way we behave in supermarkets. Are we interested in anyone else or just getting the job done? As one dad joke says, to the person who stole my place in the queue, I'm after you now. How kind are we in a supermarket? And uh, how much are we just focused on ourselves? And it's the same with all of our society. The family unit is not the basic unit of society it once was. It's now the supremacy of the individual. You know, I went to a tax conference uh, uh, about a year ago or two years ago, and I know it sounds like riveting fun, but uh, there was some two interesting cases that came out um, all in one hour. I know, it's an action-packed time. But what happened was the two cases were concerned about what's a charity. And what a charity is from a tax point of view is very important because if you're a charity, you don't pay tax on your income. Not only that, but people who give you money or donate money, like the kind people are put offering in, get a receipt at the end of the year and you get a donations rebate. But you don't get that if you're just a group. You only get it if you're a charity. And to be a charity, you have to be either for the advancement of religion or education or the uh, reduction of poverty, or any other benefit that's beneficial to the community. And two organisations applied to have charitable status, and one of them was successful, and one of them failed. And the one that was successful was a, a, an organisation, you may have heard of it, Greenpeace. And they were successful because it was felt they were beneficial to society. Now the problem with Greenpeace over the time is that they've sort of taken the law into their own hands and become very political and started uh, using their boats as sort of ramrods and attacking different things and slashing tyres and all sorts of, you know, good things for the community. But they, they got theirs because of their connection with the environment. And so Greenpeace now don't pay tax on their income and anyone who wants to donate to Greenpeace can get a third of it back. So you might give more to Greenpeace but this is not a party political broadcast. The other organisation that didn't get 
political status, uh, sorry, charitable, charitable status, was a place called Family First. They were not seen as beneficial to society in the same way Greenpeace is. They were seen as archaic and holding on to a very limited view of a family. And when I was in the, you know, the uh, lecture room or whatever that we were having this wonderful conference, all the people were just sort of shaking their head about this family first and saying how awful they were. You know, yet they were holding to a family um, you know, mantra. Is that how our society's gone? That we don't view families as important? That we don't view the importance of a father to a family, the importance of a mother to a family, the importance of children as being a unit, and that as being beneficial to society? The second question is, how does the church place with its treatment of families? How are we focused? Are we focused on just saving individuals? Or are we like Paul and Silas that looked at families, that looked at Lydia's family and looked at a jailer's family and their whole household? Do we focus on my salvation or our salvation? Because sometimes there's a difference. And we want people to be saved, but we want to look at how we do it and how our focus is. Sometimes people in church have this attitude and we're all guilty of it. Why hasn't someone from church rung me? Why hasn't someone from church baked for me? I can give you a list of all the baking and the likes I like, but you know, what is it about us that we're all instantly drawn to think about ourselves first instead of the wider thing of our families? We start to use a bit of English um, sort of mistakes here. We refer to church in the third person a lot of times. But who's the church? Us. It's like when we're watching the All Blacks. When the All Blacks win, what do we say? We won. When the All Blacks lost to Ireland, what did we say? They lost. <laughs> we need to think of the church as we. It's us. It's our job to be part of it. We're part of like a family here. We are a family. So I'll look at this one here just out of interest. I hope it's interesting. Can anyone tell me who these people are? What about this fella here? George the First. Sorry, this one here? George Sorry, I mean this one here? <laughs> this one's George the Fifth? Oh, no. Who's this one? No. The Russian, Russian guy, yeah. It went by the name of Tsar Nicholas. So this is Tsar Nicholas. This is George V. This here is, I heard it before. Guys are well known. Yes. Willie is his known to his family. This one here is Queen Victoria's daughter. Victoria is her name. And she married a German. There's nothing wrong with that, Chris. And this is her son. This one and this one are first cousins. Uh, they, their mothers are sisters. This one and this one are cousins. Mother, Queen, both have the same grandmother. You might have heard of her, Queen Victoria. So this one and this one are first cousins. This one, these two are first cousins. This one and this one are third cousins. And this one's wife is connected to this one as well. But that's another story. <laughs> so we were watching a documentary about, and it was called Cousins at War. And it was predominantly talking about this family, or this extended family. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, Victoria, or Vicky as she's known, uh, she had trouble in uh, childbirth with Kaiser Wilhelm. And as a result, he had a, a very withered arm to the point where he couldn't ride a horse properly. He had to sort of have a special saddle. And had a very funny relationship to the point, because of course Victoria was English and he was German and he hated all things English apart from Queen Victoria. He loved Queen Victoria, but everything else hated. And so here we have this breakdown of a family going on that ended in what we call a First World War. And some would see that the First World War was so unfinished that it led to another war, the Second World War. All because, or one of the causes, might have been this family breakdown. 
It's all connected to our family. In Psalm 45, verse 16 and 17, Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetrate your memory through all generations. Therefore the nations will praise you forever and ever. You know, are we leaving a legacy of faith within our families? If we go back to the Old Testament, we have a family of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that's referred to a lot. And then we have a family of David and all his descendants. Even the family of Saul was honoured by the family of David. So from a Christian and God point of view, families are really important. No matter what shape or form they take. No matter how dysfunctional they are. And there is a Christian view that sometimes people need to belong before they believe. That you have a place in your family and you have a place in this family. And we need to focus on the collective, not the individual. We're told to train our children in the ways and they will not depart from it. That the child is part of a family, not that the family worships the child. Acts 11 verse 14. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As a church, are we focusing our outreach on ch children or individuals, or are we focusing on families? In Greek, the word is oikos. It means a circle of influence in relationship. So your household that you belong to, whether it's a family or not, is a circle of influence. Look at this, uh, this chappy here. Does anyone know who this is? It's a bit dark. Can you see the picture? It's a bit dark. He's an English actor. He was in Blackadder and a, um, a series called House, which is an American series. Hugh Laurie, that's right. He had a strained relationship with his mother, whom he noted as a Presbyterian by character, by mood. Laurie's parents... Both attended St. Columba's Presbyterian Church in Oxford. He notes that belief in God didn't play a large role in his home, but a certain attitude to life and the living of it did. Pleasure was something that was to be treated with great suspicion. Pleasure was something that he was going to, he was going to say had to be earned, but even the earning of it didn't work. He doesn't believe in God, but has this idea that if he saw you taking something for granted, he would take it away. What is the tone that we're setting in our households? What's the tone we're setting in this church for families? Is it a Presbyterian grey? Or is it a life-giving, Christ-like peace? We need to see ourselves in our households as representing Christ 24-7. Living the faith every day, the ups and downs. We need to look out for each other in our households. We need to look out for each other in our church here, our family here at Windsor and Richmond Grove. Christ is with me, Christ beside me, Christ behind me, Christ wherever I go. You may be the only Christian in your household, or one of many, but that household has a special place with the Lord. Be encouraged, because you're an ambassador, a leader, and a vital cog in the gospel. As a family or household, do you talk openly about the Lord? Do you pray together? Every part of the life is connected to the Lord. It's about leaving a legacy. We can't expect the church to do the job of the family. The family is the first port of call, and it's the church, as a church, we need to look at helping. How do we help our families? We look around our church. Where are the families? Where are the ways that we can help these families and encourage them to come and to encourage more families to join our family here? The last one is uh, being sensitive to the Spirit. And woven through this whole chapter are numerous occasions where the Spirit of God was at work. Starting with Paul being blocked from going to Bithynia, and then he was blocked to, to go elsewhere, and then he was enabled to go to Macedonia and go to Philippi. David Livingston, the famous missionary, wanted to go to China, but God sent him to Africa. William Carey wanted to go to Polynesia, but God wanted him in India. Sometimes we get a closed door, and we need to be sensitive to that. 
Sometimes God speaks to us in dreams and visions. And Paul saw this uh, Macedonian man asking him to come. My brother um, was in northern France for a year in a place, a city called Arras. And you might have heard of that city if you've ever been to Wellington. It's got an Arras tunnel. And this is a city in the northern France. And the pastor of their church there was an Englishman. And he had changed his name from, I think they call it Peter, to Pierre. He had been, he had had a vision of a man saying in French, Vienne, which has come. And he had obeyed that um, instruction from the Lord and become a minister in northern France. He spoke only French. He wouldn't even speak English to me. We, we, I had to use my schoolboy French to have a, a bit of a chat to him. And, uh, but he had totally followed that leading of the Lord. Paul and Silas prayed and praised God so much that an earthquake happened. And here we have a jailer and his whole family being saved. You know, a, a few years ago, a Chinese lady came into our church. And when she heard us sing, she had this strange feeling. A, a few people do have a strange feeling when we sing, but this was a good one. She felt this peace. She had never struck before. She had come from mainland China, where it's uh, very secular. She came into church and heard people praising God, and something spoke to her. Someone, God, spoke to her and gave her a peace. And as a result, she and her family were baptized and became believers. A friend also of ours had a recent issue with one of her family members getting into trouble with the law. And the subsequent negative publicity that they all faced. She sensed a vision from God of herself sinking in a river. Only to feel the Lord had put a life jacket to allow her to float. Then as people started to turn on her family... She felt they were stabbing holes in this life jacket. These, however, were patched up with the prayers that friends and family were praying for her. You know, not only does God's Spirit send her a vision to encourage her, it encourages us, doesn't it, to pray, to listen to God, to listen to his voice, because it works. It's ironic that in the passage, the people in chains were already set free. Yet the jailer was the slave. Romans 8 talks about life in the spirit and that we need to get rid of the things that entangle. Is there something that we need to do, confess or repent, so that we can hear his spirit talk to us? The spirit was sent for equipping the church and to be sensitive to his spirit, we need to be in fellowship with each other. We need to come to church. We need to spend time with others. It's not about us and of self-importance about hearing from God. It's about God's equipping and what he wants to do. We need to follow that small, still voice that's guiding and prompting us because from small things come great things. And we shouldn't be afraid of failure because there's no such thing in the kingdom of God. Are we desensitized by society? Too much focus on Facebook, internet or busyness? And little time for us to spend praying and reading our Bibles and worshipping? Is our source of truth our electronic devices or is it scripture? A local church had a couple leave because the church hadn't done enough for them. The church wished them well but did ask, how much biblical guidance did you take to make that decision? And their response, oh no, we were too busy for that. No, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and give him time to speak and be ready to act accordingly. So, in a nutshell, this passage is about money and whether we're slave to it and our relationship and attitude towards it. It's about the importance of family and what we might do as a church to encourage other families within our church and our own family. And it's also about being spiritually sensitive to listen to God's voice. You know, church is not this building. Church is not this service either. This is actually, the church is us. And the start of the church week is, we might as well say, is now. And as we walk 
not even before we walk out this door, church is happening. We're going to walk out, we might see someone, and we're, what are we going to do? How are we going to relate to that person? Are we going to ask them, how are you? And are they going to give us an honest response and a deep response? Because that's church. And then when we walk outside and we go into our cars and we drive sensibly, that's church too. And then when we meet up in our home groups or we meet up with a coffee with someone from church, that's church too. And we need to see those things as church, not just here, not just the building. You know, in the bulletin or the newsletter, there is questions that are put at the bottom of the sermon is reprinted in case you didn't hear properly or I'm a Donaldson so I can claim Donaldson deafness but if you you know hadn't wanted to go over the message again it's printed in the newsletter and at the bottom of it are some questions and those questions are what you might study yourself or if you go to a men's group like tomorrow night at 7 30 at my place just a shameless plug if you go there, then we will be going over these questions. And for other Bible study groups, they'll be going over these questions as well. And this is just to reinforce the message that comes through on Sunday morning with your other church during the week. And so here are these questions, uh, or some of the questions. I've got two pages. I hope you can read them. just want to just read them out to you and, and just get you thinking um, before we close. So why is it important for you to have Bible study in a group? Why are families important to a church and God? What families can you name in our church? And what can you do to encourage them? Think in terms of each component of the families. Do you think Christians dichotomize their lives in terms of their attitudes to money and their faith? So do you think we split our lives between our faith, how we act as Christians, and our money is a different way of working. Are we Christians with our money, in other words? Why are Christians categorised as judgmental rather than generous? Is there any evidence in society of Christians being generous? How do we change that perception? Have you ever felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something? What steps can we take to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's prompting? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you say in your word, where two or more are gathered, you are there in the midst of us. Here we are. Here you are. Lord, speak to us, we pray, in whatever area needs to be spoken into. We pray for our church. We pray, Lord, for the families that are represented in this church, the households that are here. We pray, Lord, that we would see the opportunity to minister to families and households that are in our church and to encourage them into this family. Lord, we pray we may be sensitive this week, particularly to your spirit. Help us to hear your voice and help us to act on that voice. And Lord, examine our attitudes to money and guide us in the way you want us to bring glory to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Craig, and you've certainly given us a great deal to reflect on, and thank you for your message this morning. Let's conclude our service by singing our final hymn, All Is Well.
prediction up on the screen? Picking up Craig's theme, we're going to say the grace to each other. So I'm not going to say it to you and you all bow your heads and don't look at anybody. So as we say it, we're going to make eye contact to members of our family as we pray the blessing of the grace upon them. So let's do that now. Be prepared to turn around and look at people. All right? So let's say it. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. May God go with you this week. It's been a blessing to have you at this service.